In the beginning, there was nothing by way of self-propelled artillery. America was initially interested in the idea at the end of World War I, but unfortunately, we decided to not invest in it during a period of isolationism that followed that war, and so it wasn't very good. Then, of course, World War II comes along, and the idea gets reignited. And so we decide to create a different type of howitzer motor carriage, the T-19, which was just a half-track with a 105mm howitzer in the back of it. But that half-track couldn't sustain the recoil of this massive cannon, nor could it carry much ammunition, only seven rounds in its body. So it wasn't very good. So America turns to something with a heftier, more robust hull to transport this massive gun. So they look to our medium tanks, the M3 and the M4 mediums. This made a different kind of vehicle, one that allowed America to fully mechanize its artillery in armored regiments, and it became the first country in the world to do so. This was the M7 Priest, and it was good. The M7 was built first on the M3 medium tank hull. That's what we can see here. And we know this vehicle is an M7 because it has that M3 hull that also featured that radial engine that we saw in the M3 tanks and later the M4s. And in fact, the M7 itself would also later feature the M4 hull. And all the advances in that tank's drive system and later engines also reflected in this vehicle's construction. In fact, there was only one other variant of the M7 Priest made during the war other than the M7 itself, and that would be the M7B1, which had only one major change, which reflected the changes of the M4 Sherman. And that's that the M7B1 mounted a 4GAA engine, which we would find in an M4A3 Sherman. The technical name for this vehicle is the M7 HMC, or Howitzer Motor Carriage, but that name is a fair bit long. Instead, I'll use the British nickname for this vehicle, the Priest. The British called this vehicle that because it has this pulpit here, which would usually have a 50 caliber machine gun on it. But it's also interesting to know that the British were the first to receive this vehicle in North Africa in September of 1942. They wouldn't actually take part in a battle until October of the same year, fighting at the Second Battle of El Alamein. The British really needed self-propelled artillery because they were dealing with this out in the battlefield. It's the venerable German 8.8 centimeter flat cannon. These 88s were hidden in what we call tank traps. They were buried halfway in the ground, which made them very hard to fire at and furthermore allowed them to attack British vehicles as they were approaching. So British tankers were being wiped out before they could actually destroy these 88s on the ground. So they wanted an artillery piece that was reactive. It could follow those British tanks and destroy these 88s before they ever got within range. And the M7 was perfect for this role. It had a 105 millimeter howitzer on it, which could fire around at a range of over seven miles, a high explosive one to boot, which could easily land in the middle of a tank trap destroy this gun and its crew. At the Second Battle of El Alamein, it did just that, and on the M3 hull, the M7s were easily able to keep pace with the M4 Shermans and British tanks of the era, and the British gave it glowing reviews following the end of that battle. This kind of reactive artillery, artillery that can move and follow an armored advance, became really important in the overall Allied strategy when we finally entered into Western Europe and Italy. The battery is the smallest administrative unit of artillery. Gun, howitzer, and rocket batteries, since they contain personnel and equipment necessary for conduct and delivery of fire, communication, supply, maintenance, and movement, may also operate as separate tactical units. A reading from FM 6-140, the Field Artillery Battery. This is the veritable gospel of operating artillery batteries out here in the battlefield behind the lines in World War II. But if you're gonna treat an FM like this, a field manual, as the gospel, there is gonna be a little bit of theological debate. You see, sometimes even behind the lines, army units didn't necessarily do everything by the book. And the example that we're about to show you, while it is based in theory that informed the practice, is not necessarily accurate to how things might have been organized on the front line. That being said, what I really am trying to give you an idea of here is the kind of vehicles that went into the makeup of an armored field artillery battalion and also an armored field artillery battery by using some stuff that I found here in my pockets. And gentlemen, I'm gonna need to borrow your table. The Armored Field Artillery Battalion consists of five separate artillery batteries, three of which are what we call the Howitzer Battery, which consists mainly of M7 Priests. The other two are the Headquarters Battery and then also the Service Battery, which are a little bit different than the simplified example that we have here. So really what we're trying to do is show you what kind of the main meat is with our little Howitzer Battery example on the table here. We begin first with the M7s themselves. They're lined up in a group of six here, and on the battlefield, they're never gonna be in a direct line like this. Usually they'll be staggered, so maybe we'll have them in a position such as this, so that that way they don't interfere with each other's firing lines, but most importantly, they can't be wiped out by an aircraft coming in for a strafing run, because if you're in a straight line, everybody here is gonna get bombed. But that's the priests, and they aren't alone out here in the battery. A howitzer battery also had a lot of support vehicles, mainly half-tracks, which unfortunately I don't have something as cool as these little tanks to represent. We just have pocket change. 
But most of these half tracks we don't really need to cover here in this example because they're not really doing all that much when the actual battery is out trying to do fighting. Let's say that our little battery has just arrived at its position. Initially, the first thing they're going to communicate with is just radios. Somewhere back behind the lines, even further away from this howitzer battery, is the headquarters battery. And the headquarters battery has the battalion FDC, or Fire Direction Center. It's from the Fire Direction Center that reports are coming in from the battlefield, and they have to be communicated out to the howitzer battery so they can actually fire at the enemy. If a battery is going to occupy a position for longer than normal, they want to install something a bit more hardwired, literally, than radio. And so they're going to install what's called field telephone. And these field telephone wires are first going to extend from a fire control half-track up here to these individual groups of M7s. Then that connection will later extend back to the battery commander in his half-track, and then we'll end up lacing that connection sometimes all the way back to the FDC itself, headed by the battalion commander. But where does all that information come from? That's coming from the forward observers out here on the front line. Remember that headquarters battery that I was talking about way at the beginning of this example? Well, that headquarters battery has something in it that we refer to as the organic observer element. These would actually be three M4 Shermans that were technically a part of the Armored Field Artillery Battalion. But they're not going to be back here with the battalion. They're going to be up on the front lines fighting alongside a proper armored regiment like the 6th Armored, for example. Now, as an armored regiment advances down the line, those three M4 Shermans are providing a kind of spotter role for the battalion back behind the lines. They are spotting the enemy that the 6th Armored, in this case, is attacking, and they're going to report their positions back to the battalion FDC. Remember that dice that we had here in our example. And as that information is coming to the FDC, again, it's passed on to these M7s who then shell said enemy. So now, as that armored regiment moves forward, as does our armored field battalion behind the lines. And this kind of natural advance means that we always have artillery supporting that armor advance. They never overextend past their artillery support because the artillery is literally moving with them. And this kind of mobile warfare here is really going to be a huge deal for America and our allies, especially on the Western Front, also down in Italy. And it really becomes kind of the crux of Allied strategy, especially when it comes to motorized artillery and armored advances throughout World War II. So far, we've covered the base M7 Priest and its World War II variant, the M7B1. But now we're winding the clocks forward a little bit into the 1950s, where the M7 was still in use by the American military. But now it's been changed slightly for its use in the Korean War. So we have this new variant behind me, the M7B2. Now, the M7B2 has a couple of different changes on it, but one of them actually dates back to a change that was made during World War II itself. That's going to be the folding Sponson armor that we see on the side of the vehicle right over here. These folding plates allow us to pass ammunition back up into those ready racks, which we'll talk about here in a minute, and also protects them from shrapnel and sometimes strafing fire if the vehicle is out in the battlefield. So these are added in the factory to these vehicles starting in 1943. But the most notable changes to the M7B2 are those that have been given to it for its use in the Korean War. They're responding to a big problem out here in Korea, which was going to be Korean mountains. The ground-based version of the 105mm howitzer could move itself to an angle of roughly 65 degrees, which allowed it to fire right over those mountains. It had a good enough arc to do so. However, inside of an M7, that howitzer was restricted to only 35 degrees, which was a big problem heading into Korea. So the B2 adds a new mount for that howitzer, which allows it to articulate to that proper degree, and now it can fire rounds over mountains. But that meant that we now had to increase the height here of this pulpit to allow that machine gun to rotate 360 degrees around the pulpit, even when the howitzer was at its highest position. So that's why the pulpit behind me looks so much taller than the one that we saw at the very beginning of this video. So two big changes to the priest made here in the Korean War. But something that we've neglected so far in our conversation about this vehicle is the crew inside it. But they're not actually called a crew. They're called a section, an artillery section to be more specific, because again, this vehicle isn't a tank. It's a howitzer motor carriage. So let's talk about exactly what that section does and how many of those guys there actually were. The gun section consists of section personnel, the 105mm howitzer M2A1 or M2, mounted on a motor carriage M7B1 or M7B2, and auxiliary equipment. The personnel of the gun sections are 1. The chief of section, 2. The gunner, 3. An assistant gunner, 4. Four cannoneers, numbered 2 through 5, and 5. A motor carriage driver. A reading from FM 6-74, 105mm howitzer M2A1 on motor carriage M7B1 and M7B2. 
Well, I'll tell you what, it gets crowded up here. There are eight artillerymen that have to work together in this section inside this vehicle when it is firing, no matter where it is on the line. If all eight of me were in here, try to imagine what the kind of din the crowd would be like as we're trying to work together to load this weapon in combat. Now, what I'm standing in right now is the chief of section's position. He's essentially the tank commander of the M7, and his job is really just to coordinate the actions of everybody else in the vehicle. He's also the one receiving those verbal orders that are coming up from those guys in those half tracks I was talking about before, or he's got his ear to that field telephone. Again, he's being told where the vehicle needs to shoot, and then he's passing that on to the rest of his men. The gunner of the M7 is seated in the position that I'm in now, and his job is to change the traverse and deflection of the gun next to me here using a variety of hand cranks in front of me, and he's doing all this based on the directions given to him by the chief of section who'd be standing right next to him. The assistant gunner's position is what I'm currently seated in. He's got a variety of different jobs to do here next to the howitzer. He's actually in the pulpit of the priest itself. The first thing he does is he lays the elevation of this gun by way of this hand crank right here, which is a little bit hard to do alone, but you can see there's a second hand crank moving on the other side of the gun, so we have assistance from the gunner in order to do that. He also operates the breech of the gun that we see right here, and he also fires the weapon by means of what we call a lanyard, which is actually back here. It's essentially like a ripcord on the back end of the gun. Our M7B2's lanyard has seen better days, but this is a piece of it that's still left here in the vehicle. During travel, the assistant gunner is going to be operating the heavy machine gun up here on the pulpit itself, which again can rotate 360 degrees on our M7B2. There are four cannoneers inside this vehicle, and they're actually labeled two through five. The first cannoneer is cannoneer number two, and he's standing where I am, and his only job is to load the howitzer. Cannoneer number three, positioned in this part of the vehicle, has a job to set the fuse on the ammunition that would be here for the howitzer. And that's essentially going to be coordinated with the amount of distance it has to travel before it actually hits the target. Cannoneer number four, who's roughly over here, will actually be over there assisting cannoneer number three in building the ammunition for this gun. You see, M7 ammunition actually came in two parts out of a cardboard tube, which we'll talk about here in a moment. And those parts are separating into the round itself and then the brass shell. The shell had seven charges inside of it, one base charge and six incremental charges. And those charges could be removed based on how far the projectile had to travel in the battlefield. Cannoneer number five's job is to remove ammunition from wherever it might be found here on the vehicle. Sometimes it was stowed underneath the floorboards of this vehicle, but most of the time it was in what we call the ready racks, these little cells that are on either side of the firing compartment. Your average shell for an M7 would be in one of these. This basically cardboard tube that contained not only the projectile itself, but also the brass shell removed from either side side of this cardboard container, and of course Cannoneer 5 was doing that. But sometimes Cannoneer 5 wouldn't be in this vehicle at all. If the priest was in a more permanent position though, the fifth Cannoneer would actually climb out of the vehicle and oftentimes pull ready ammunition from crates on the ground rather than the racks inside the vehicle. This represents the stockpile of ammunition the battery had brought with them to their position behind the battlefield, and it was a lot easier to fire a sustained bombardment when you had ammunition available like this, with your Cannoneer able to pass it up to the rest of the Cannoneers in the vehicle itself. The driver is obviously driving the vehicle, and even during firing, he'd sometimes be seated down here in his position in the off chance the M7 had to change its direction out on the battlefield. And yes, sometimes that meant running away from an enemy advance, but most of the time it would be physically turning the M7 to the left or to the right in the off chance that the gun's traverse here ran out of travel. As a side note, our M7B2 here in the Korean War exhibit is actually kind of painted up in a special paint scheme. You'll notice here it says 300 AFA on the side of it, which represents the 300th Armored Field Artillery artillery battalion that were actually members of the Wyoming National Guard. The Cowboy Cannoneers, as they called themselves, served from the beginning of the Korean War in 1951 all the way until its end. At one point at the Battle of Soyang, at the beginning of the Korean War, they fired almost 7,200 rounds at 12 Chinese divisions. That was just between two separate units. And by the end of the war, they had fired over 500,000 rounds of ammunition at the enemy. They became one of the most awarded artillery units of the war, returning back to the United States with two presidential unit citations, 12 silver stars, 63 bronze stars, and numerous other awards. The thing I love the most about the 300th AFA is that they brought with them a sign that they had stolen from the Wyoming Department of Transportation to the Korean War, and they placed it at every one of their artillery positions behind the lines. And since that day, just about any single Wyoming National Guard unit that goes overseas, at least the majority of them that I've spoken with, have been given one of those signs, an entering Wyoming sign to carry on this tradition that began with a bunch of Wyomingites in the Korean War, and they were all operating M7 priests. Before we kind of wrap up our thoughts here on the M7, I'd be remiss not to mention its various international variants deployed by other allies. For example, there was the British Sexton, essentially an M7, but with a different gun, the British 25-pounder, that was easier for them to supply ammunition for. 
And then there was also the Canadian Kangaroo, an M7 Priest that removed the gun altogether and added on some extra armor to make it into a pretty effective armored personnel carrier. The M7 itself also didn't just serve in Europe with America. It also served overseas, a little bit in the Pacific, for example, where it fought in the Philippines and the Battle of Okinawa. If there's one thing that I hope you take away from this video, it's that wars aren't just won by tanks. Artillery and other support technologies behind the lines are just as important to the front line as any armored vehicle you might see here in a museum. I hope this vehicle kind of drives that point home. And when you think about a quote from perhaps General George S. Patton, where he said, I don't need to tell you who won the war. Artillery did. Again, you can think about a vehicle like this, the M7 Priest. I'd also like to make a quick distinction between a howitzer motor carriage, uh, that is self-propelled artillery, and the assault gun. When I said earlier that America was the first to embrace the idea of self-propelled artillery, some people might point to assault guns like the Stug 3, used by the Germans, that was an exception to that rule. Then the Su-122, used by the Soviets, was a similar deal. But that isn't an artillery weapon. Again, that's close-range support, so I'd like to just make that brief distinction for those who might want to ask about it in the comments. But that being said, overall, the M7 Priest was an incredibly effective vehicle everywhere that it served here in World War II, whether it was on the European front, out in the Pacific, in Italy, or North Africa. And so truly, if there ever was a priest in your area, you'd best say your prayers.